You're listening to The Valley Current. I don't know about maybe. How are you doing? Good. You look great, man. Okay, you too. You're getting some it? sun or something? I see some sunburn going on there. Uh, yeah, something. Not really sunburn, something. Oh, it's good. You look thinner, too. I am thinner. Well, that's good. I think we're all losing weight because we're not going to restaurants. The only entertainment these days is grocery stores, though. <laughs> no place else to go. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I have to say that I, I've been thinking about that Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. Is that oh, the way yes. it goes? And I know you're kind of, you know, you study some of that Asian literature yes. and poetry. And I keep thinking to myself, are the Chinese just cracking up reading some of this stuff? Because they've got to be saying to themselves, Donald, 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 what are you doing? Every day, it's every hour almost. It's a new story, isn't it? Amazing. And, it's and really, it's, and it's depressing to me. My wife and I are sick because of it. Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, I laugh about it, but I know what you're saying. You can laugh or cry in your beard, depending yeah. on your perspective. But, yeah. you know, I have to say, you know, you were gracious enough to come in on really less than 24 hours notice because I had a reporter send me a copy of the complaint that was filed. I guess it was filed yesterday. And the reporter said, can you believe this? What's, your, what's going on here? I, I said, I said, I got to get some other people in this because this is, seems unprecedented. A hundred plus pages of detailed complaint requiring a specific performance type injunction, a mandatory injunction to compel completion of a pre-publication review. I thought the First Amendment was we shall make no laws inhibiting speech in any way. I mean, maybe there's well, some exception, but man, it's all, a wild exception. First of all, I, I was looking, I am looking for a copy of this complaint. I couldn't find one. I looked all over the internet. Okay, well, I, I sent you a copy. You got the one I sent you, right? No. If, I, you did, if you didn't, then it's been blocked and I have to resend it to you. But I'll, I'll I didn't get, up, let, me, let me look again. I'll put it up on the screen because I know I sent it to your regular email address because for some reason the other email address for your business, the rentajudge.com address, keeps bouncing. But I'm going to. No, gonna no. My rentajudge.com is only for support at Rent-A-Judge. It's not my personal email. Ah, okay. So now Raphael I get that right. at com is the one. Now I, I get that get, right. Okay, I didn't fair get enough. The complaint. Okay, so let me do this. Let me put it on the screen for a second because I do have it here, and I will resend it, and we will. Uh, now I have it. Yeah, we will. We will perhaps bring it up on the screen and talk a little bit about it because. There's really a not a lot to it, even though it's over 100 pages, it's about 20 pages of complaint, 27 or so, and like 90 of exhibits. So I'm just, the story is really in the first paragraph. Of course, I always note, I always note the typographical errors like defendant should be period here and they've got a comma. Maybe they were, maybe they were thinking there'd be other parties, I don't know. It starts with, this is a civil action by the United States, not Donald Trump, but the United States to prevent defendant John R. Bolton, an individual, the former national security advisor from compromising national security by publishing a book containing classified information in clear breach of agreements he signed as a condition of employment, as, as condition of gaining access to highly classified information and in clear breach of trust which made me think of you because they actually do plead a fiduciary duty cause of action. And I know you haven't read this and I thought we got this delivered to you yesterday, but maybe there was a screw up on my end. It tells this detailed story of this amazing book, which by the way, I already pre-ordered on Amazon. It's supposed to be delivered on Monday. And oh. they're saying the book is on the trucks. It's on in transit on UPS trucks making their way to California long distance. So they're, they're looking for a blockage of those trucks, even though UPS is not a defendant, Federal Express is not a defendant, the Postal Service is not a defendant, but I guess they think they're gonna get an injunction. So I'm gonna do what we always do in the law firm, and I've always done since really starting uh, uh, post-law school, even when I was clerking, if you look at the bottom of the complaint, I'll just quickly go, and I know we're right. going fast here, but I think it's worth doing this fast. You'll see that they've got, um, let me get to the right page here. I'm gonna get to page 27. 
the remedy that they're seeking, and let's just start there before we get through the actual complaint, because there's a lot of information that's in exhibits, but you'll see they had a bunch of different lawyers, and you'll see the relief they're asking for. Right. This, by the way, you'll agree, is the fast way of figuring out what a lawsuit is about. Just oh, read yeah. the first paragraph and then read the prayer and ask yourself, do they have a prayer of getting any of this relief? I mean, literally, in the sort of hyperbolic way I'm saying it, declare that defendant has breached his legal obligations embodied in his NDAs, plural, as well as his fiduciary obligations by submitting for publication and otherwise disclosing information in, and the name of the book is The Room Where It Happened, Room where it happened. without completing pre-publication review. But, but he's not the one who's doing the review, it's them. The They're plaintiff. doing the review, but he's refusing to cooperate in the redaction process. Oh, but I read that he cooperated fully in the submission and was waiting for the reviewing body to give him results. And when you get to the details, they were negotiating the last few changes. I see. He wouldn't make them. He did what might be called the brinksmanship a fake accompli, I think is the French wording. Yes. But if we had Professor Nimmer on, he would tell me I'm pronouncing that wrong. You'll probably say it's, it's, it's a it, done deal. That's yeah, what it's it a done deal. And they said, wait a minute, it's not a done deal. And if you're really going to force our hand, then you're going to face a lawsuit. Now, my view is they've just increased the sales of this books by, by like 10x. Well, I have a question for you, general questions. In order to make a, comp I, was, I wanted to read the complaint to see if they disclosed any confidences in the complaint. In other words, they say he's going to disclose government secrets. What secrets are you talking about? Do they well, say? Right, because let's go with like standard law. You cannot stop the publication of a work that is not yours. They didn't write the book. He wrote the book. Now, the right. question is, are there snippets of information that can be redacted? That's the normal process, just so the audience knows. As lawyers, when we file lawsuits that contain anything confidential, we have to redact, but the court gets the full copy, but the public gets the redacted version. I can't tell you how much wasted time there is. I, you know, I'm a big believer in, it's like a full employment lawyers, uh, lawyers full employment act. I've been railing against this for a long time. Most of this stuff is not confidential, but people want to be so careful. And I say this, I want to complete your question because I think it needs an additional clause added. In light of what's already been published about this book, Add to it all the extrinsic evidence, including a Wall Street Journal article that ran last Thursday that talked about what the heck is going on here that you're going up against Bolton on something everyone more or less knows that you're basically a loudmouth Twitter. You, you send off all sorts of stuff by Twitter. You allow video of, of things that are confidential to happen all over the place. How can you be someone, you're like the kettle calling the pot black. All and right. So, and so you're saying, look, step one, if you're being a rigorous lawyer, the law professor view would very much be step one, read the complaint thoroughly, read the prayer, but ask yourself, what the hell are they talking about as the list of alleged secrets? There's no list in this. There's no, here's our secrets. Here's what we're trying to stop. It's all very, very verbose but in general, not specific. And you would say, how are you gonna get relief without parsing and filtrating what the heck is already out there? Because the public domain is full of all sorts of right. hearsay about what's happened in that room and what oh, happened okay. beyond that room. Well, what do you think, uh, as an attorney, we receive matters in confidence we're obligated to maintain the confidence. Yes. Bus business and professions code, I forgot, 6068. Yes. And even after our relationship with the client is terminated, we have to maintain the confidences. Okay. Now, so suppose are you we tell the client, screw you, I'm going to publish a book which tells the whole story, including the confidential matter. See, I knew you would do this because I had not thought at all about why don't we take the angle? Why doesn't the government take the angle? that Bolton was effectively like a lawyer, or maybe he right. was a lawyer, or he maybe was. he's and equivalent to a lawyer, right. and he's giving legal advice and the 6068 type of super privilege right. for anything secret, 
even if it's questionably secret. No, okay. Now, my book has a long discussion of secrecy. Yes. Uh, and the difference between confidential and secret. Yes. And confidential is what the client wants you to keep secret. Yes. Whether it's secret or not. So my question is, I've, I've never had to deal with this in litigation, but if somebody s threatens to publish material which he had agreed to keep secret yes. or confidential, yes. what is the remedy and how does it work? Do I go to court and say, here's what he signed, here's what I told him was confidential, but I'm redacting that from the public record, and I want you to order him not to reveal it. Is that the way it works? Well, I think the way it works is somewhere between what is the information in the context of what is known publicly, and what does your layer of supporting it with your reputation and sponsorship do to injure his deniability of what might otherwise be quasi-public. Do you follow what I'm saying? I do, but of course that, his, his injure his reputation is not part of the disclosing confidence issue. No, but to what degree would you say at some level, the court has in mind, you were a fiduciary, you still have a little bit of the patina of former client fiduciary responsibility right. We do not want you to injure the reputation of the bar as a whole by saying, if you go to a lawyer and you trust the lawyer, boy, are they going to be able to slam you unless there's an attorney fee argument that requires the disclosure of that information to support the defense of some sort of claim involving malpractice, professional liability, or attorney's fees kind of offset. Stop, or stop there. Right. By suing Bolton, did he waive the privilege? Well, because now, Bolton now has a but uh, now it's not it's not Donald it's the government it's the United States it's not it's not Donald Trump though right I mean you could argue Donald Trump is a bystander to this case but we know he's not a bystander we know he's driving this he drives everything associated with his public persona he's upset about all these tell all books this is another tell all book it goes into the volumes of tell-all books. I think there's been a hundred already. One zero zero. If we search on Amazon, it's a lot of books. Really? I just read that his niece is being. He's threatening to sue his niece for another one. Right, because but, there was something to do with his father's estate that required confidentiality post distribution, that sort right. of thing. Well, but wait a minute. If the United States is the plaintiff, yes, and it that Bolton signed an agreement with the United States. Yes. By suing, does not the United States waive its confidence, its privileges? Well, that's the question here. I mean, you're raising the right questions, which is how does Bolton defend himself? Does he have to assume that they're right? Or can he say to a court, I don't think they're right. You take a look at this stuff. I'll provisionally show it to you. But this is nonsense. I mean, they're asking me right. to cover up embarrassing stuff he's embarrassed about it because look right. how far they go declare that he's breached uh, his obligations embodied in the nda as well as fiduciary obligations enter an order directing defendant to notify his publisher that he was not authorized and he has not completed the review because it contains classified information he's never going to agree that it contains classified information i mean how can you also how can you force someone to do that? Also, there's a highly, the whole business of classified information is highly suspect. I think the United States has tens of millions of documents, uh, adding millions every year to the classified category. And there's no supervision of it. Well, the only supervision of it is the Freedom of Information Act. And I right. think you're right that it's a weak, weak way to maybe a year or two from now get information that's most relevant right now over the next six right. months leading up to the less than six months leading right. up to the up to the actual election itself, assuming the election is going to be held in November, right? If we well, make assuming. that assumption. Assuming. Right. I mean, I, well, this, so, I, I think at the end of the day, what you're saying is, look, there's so many issues that are raised just by the filing of this lawsuit, just right. the filing of it alone. May I ask you to send me a PDF? I'm looking at the PDF on my screen, but you didn't send me an email with the PDF. Yeah, it. I think what happened is it got stymied. So I'm going to resend it right now. It probably got stymied in the email sending process. So I think it's so big. What's going on here, Raphael? Oh, okay. So big 
that it got blasted. So I'm going to send it as the as a link that should allow you to open it as a link. But I'll send it both Fine. ways as both an attachment and a link, and we can continue part two. But I think part one would be useful, just general observations, because I do think the general observations are really interesting about how unique this filing is. I mean, it's a very unique filing. You don't see this every day of the week. I think I've seen something like this maybe once or twice before. And, and even in that context, it was sort of like, wow, that's a pretty unique thing. And it usually involves someone having stolen, like I'm thinking that case involving President, not Nixon, but the guy who followed him, the guy who was the vice president that followed him and pardoned Ford. him, Ford. Ford did papers Ford. that were stolen from his safe. And there was a case brought to stop the publication of his unpublished work papers. This was a draft of a book. And the Supreme Court said, wait a minute, we're not going to let some thief publish papers. That's not a First Amendment, right? That's stealing somebody else's right of publication. You get as the author to decide the timing of a publication. People can't take that away from you. That's part of your right as an author to decide on the timing, the scope, All and right. the content. I have uh, drafts of books that are a thousand pages that I've written that I won't publish because no one will read them. I got to get it down to like 300 pages, but it's going to take a lot of work to get there. Someone shouldn't go into my safe. It's not actually in a safe. It's probably sitting right on my desk hoping to get some attention. Uh, but a maid comes in here to clean up or a butler or someone. Of course, we don't have a maid or a butler. But if we did, hey, pick up the book and say, hey, I can sell this. I'm sure Norton wouldn't buy it or anyone else. But it's kind of an interesting story, right? Right. So I just resent to you as a link. You should see it at your Raphael at Chodos.com address, a link to what should be the complete PDF, all 117 pages. But while okay, you look that? at it, let me just go through the rest of this because this will be part one of a two-part story. They want him to be enjoined from any further violations of the terms or conditions of the NDAs and his fiduciary duties to the United States by taking any steps towards publicly disclosing the information in the room where it happened without first obtaining written permission. This sounds like a trade secret case. This sounds like a breach of fiduciary duty slash trade secret case now. I, I have deep, deep suspicion of the government. I don't think that, I'm not convinced that almost any information should be kept secret, except literally in wartime, in legitimate wartime. Not right. in our days. Not in our days, right? I mean, we have a various conflicts going on around the world, but we don't have a war going we on. We don't have a war. World. And I don't know what gives them the right to say, you're damaging the United States by revealing this information. That's just not right. It doesn't convince me. Well, it doesn't convince. I think most judges, and can you imagine if the judge that gets this case assigned randomly is Emmett Sullivan, who's got the Flynn case? I mean, we were laughing about this last night as we were talking about it. He refused it. We to saying, allow the dismissal. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's going to laugh at this. He's going to say, Mr. Trump wants to do what? Uh, and join a 500-page book because it's got a couple of snippets that embarrass him? Are you serious? I mean, I could, it, depending on who, who the judge is. So let's go to E. In light of the steps already taken to disclose or publish where it happened, the room where it happened, I think it would have been better if they just called it where it happened, but you know, yeah. that's just me shortening the title. Yeah. Especially in the event defendant does not complete the review process. Of course, they could drag this review process out until after the election. Of course. Right? I mean, that's the problem. I, I mean, the phrase defendant does not complete, they're the ones completing it. Well, they're, they're doing the review. They're effectively saying they have control over his consent process because right. he's not consented. I mean, look, if you look at all the emails that are attached, and it does take about a couple of hours slog through them, I did that slog. It's the classic tit for tat. Uh, this does this. Your change is not going far enough. They redact a bunch of stuff. This is why it has to be changed. They're rewriting the book. They're rewriting stuff in the book because they don't want embarrassment. And the fact of life is, the First Amendment does not protect embarrassment. Embarrassment happens all the time. 
parody happens all the time. Criticism right. happens all the time. Right. There's a First Amendment and fair use right under copyright law to right. do that. Right. So even well, if even if they gave even if these guys had taken the view, which they couldn't, because government works are not protected by copyright. But if they could, by saying, "Look, he relied on a compilation of documents that have copyrights in them." and he's infringing the copyright owned by Mr. Trump or by the U.S. or both, which can exist because government workers work for the public domain, supposedly. Right. Uh, the net net outcome is that this is something where they are really trying to stop something that even copyright law wouldn't stop because there's a fair use right. And there's also, of course, the, the right of the First Amendment, which is arguably even broader than a fair use right. And also, also co-authorship. Bolton is probably one of the authors of many of these documents. Exactly. So he's like, well, he would, the argument he would make is as a co-author, I put in the public domain what I co-authored and I'm relying on the right. same public domain because he right. was the government worker getting a government salary, although there really isn't any mention of how much they paid him. But get this, they want an accounting of all monies, gains, profits, royalties, and other advantages. How can you possibly, as the government, even assert that? I would be embarrassed to assert that. You want to strip this guy of any money as though he murdered Mr. Trump and is writing the murder novel or the murder autobiography about how he did it? I mean, there are laws against that as a deterrent right. to people doing crazy stuff for money. Even lawyers can't get those rights to, to write the book about, you know, the death row guy who's going to tell them the right. story. Although I guess in some states they can. But then they cite Rule 65 and talk about essentially the way I read the citation is to say they're going to go in to get a TRO and a preliminary injunction. There's right. no time to wait for a trial of this case. They've right. got to have a trial tomorrow to get a record that could actually go up on appeal, right? Right. I mean... It's an interesting question. The citation to D2 is really, to me, about a provisional remedy of an extreme nature because it's a prior restraint. And then they ask for the government's attorney's fees? How's that for icing on the cake? What attorney's fees? The government works for the government. Government lawyers work for the government. They're not charging the government for this. That's a deterrent kind of statement. And I don't know if you're these guys, one, two, three, four, five lawyers on this. What? I don't know which one is senior. I guess six, if you say the assistant down below, different name. His name is not even on the top. But well, the what guy about, who finds it is What Danny. about William Barr, whom I hate? He's well, he's not, not on here. He's not on here at all. I don't see that he's on here. They did, they did put two signatures, though. They right. did put a, a trial attorney. I guess the signal is they're going to use a special guy named Michael Girardi. But I have to say, I haven't looked up the bar numbers. I'm a member of the D.C. bar as well. I could try to figure out where they stack based on my number because I've been a member for going on 40 years. Uh -huh. but generally speaking, I kind of wonder, what were they thinking? By the way, the complaint is not a verified complaint, so it's essentially a lawyer making assertions not under oath but i think they do a pretty good job just so everyone knows not to give the government grief they do a pretty good job at what i would call putting in all the detail but with redaction so the redactions start right there so security number of bolton is not there you know that they basically are saying these are the agreements that he signed about sensitive information and so on this is the standard form of how when you work for the government, if anyone wants to know what happens, I guess he signed up in April of 2018, just yeah. over two years ago. Of course, he's, he left there a while ago. Um, Let me interject. Mm -hmm. This is an agreement signed before the information became accessible to him. Correct. Isn't it invalid on that ground that it was well, not? Well, that's the question. They, they cite federal law, and I think they think this is pretty much a solely governed by federal law agreement. But I don't know if that's going to be absolutely true here. I don't know if the governing law is strictly just federal law, because I don't think of federal law as having any sort of independent fiduciary duty yeah. law. That's, that's one of the reasons I thought calling you would be helpful, because it is kind of a law school exam. Is this something where you would say there is an independent body of federal fiduciary common law? 
No, no. Some form. I mean, fiduciary Lou law in my book was always that of the 50 states. Yeah, but something else here. If I make a deal with you in California, okay, uh, Jack, everything I disclose to you in the future will be kept confidential. And you promise, you sign an agreement saying it'll all be confidential. Yes. But you haven't seen it. Yes. Is there a meeting of the minds? Yes. Well, the theory is that you're binding yourself to future activities that you should reasonably foreseeable. I'll tell you how this comes up, Raphael, in California and Silicon Valley all the time. Game developer, typically an individual author, writes a game, goes to an electronic arts or another big publisher and says, okay, I got this great game. It's called it Space Shuttle. It's about the Space Shuttle. Will you publish? Yes, we will but your next nine games have to come to us. He says, I don't even know what the next nine games, it could be, you know, a million different things that are like blanket. We're only publishing this on condition that you have granted us in advance on the same terms and conditions. Nine more games will pay you in advance when you deliver the advance on this one's hundred K you'll get another hundred K you get another hundred K guys. Like, I don't know. What if I come up with something really like Pokemon? What if it's worth a million? Well, you could tell us and we'll negotiate, but basically you can't go anywhere else. No, no, no. This is different because we all know what a game is. Yes. But this is information that isn't described at all. So your argument is it's too generic. Yeah. It's no, way too generic. No meeting of the minds. No meeting of the minds because even a guy like Bolton, as sophisticated as he is, which he is, you'd say he could not fathom that he was ever even going to write this book. No, not even... only that. No, no, no because he doesn't know what's going to be labeled classified and right. they have complete right to do it. Yes. There's no, no meeting of the minds. Okay. It's almost like an illusory contract yes. in some ways, right? I, among its other weaknesses, it's illusory. Right. But look at what they do in exhibit B. It looks like a trade secret exit. As of September, 2019, he's exiting and they're doing the subject matter kind of approach, which is like, okay, uh, we want to let you know about your post-employment obligations. This is standard stuff that you see in Silicon Valley and in Los Angeles and really throughout the United States to remind the ex-employee that they have certain post-employment restrictions, typically in California, never a non-compete. Right. Typically in California, uh, all about trade secrets and trade fiduciary duties, right? And poaching employees. And poaching employees to the extent uh, that there's right. a lot of law now that's saying that that's not even something right. you can get anymore. Non-solicitation agreements. That's a whole nother topic we should cover, but right. I don't think you're going to see anything in this document. I was looking very quickly that says you're a fiduciary like a former lawyer and you're really going to have to do the right thing. Please understand and consult with a fiduciary expert like professor Raphael Chodos. He wrote the book about fiduciary duty. We're gonna give you a free copy and access to his website. Maybe he'll give you some freebie pro bono work, although in my way, that advice would be worth you know $10,000 an hour if he ever called you, probably more than that. I know your rate is less expensive than that, but think about it. They could have literally set this up to say, you are really a fiduciary, please sign up. But look at this, lifetime ban on switching sides who are participating in particular matters from switching sides and representing someone else on the same manner. This sounds very much like you are our lawyer and you have been our lawyer. And this is like a special rule dealing with, you can't jump over and take some adversarial view for say right. a lobbying group, right? Yeah, I, I mean, we have, I was just looking in my book. I, I cite some cases about this former, you, you leave the client, you cannot now represent his adversary or take a position in subsequent litigation adverse to the interests you represented at the beginning. That's but clear. You, you know, the interesting part, Raphael, I wonder whether in truth, if we had kind of an open line, you know, hey, John Bolton, if you want to come on the show, just send me an email. You might be listening to this at some point. Did you really understand all these restrictions going in? Because your tenure was only a couple of years there. You know, basically your tenure, less than a couple of years, April, 2008, 18 months, right. for 18 months, you were getting all this baggage. Did you understand that you might be shown the door? Because I don't think he quit. I think he was shown the door. They may have technically gotten his resignation, but it was under pressurized 
constructive termination circumstances because, man, I remember he was pretty upset with Trump about some of the stuff that was going down. Right. And do you think he really understood? I mean, you, I mean, he's a smart guy. Clearly, John Bolton's a smart guy. Did he really up front? They didn't give him this memo up front and say, by the way, before you sign, this is what you're going to get on the way out. You may right. want to think through whether you truly want to sign because we don't want you to feel like we took advantage of you. I mean, think about this. This is like the kitchen sink. This is like everything that we can say about what we can squeeze out of all that, that fine type. Because look at the type at least is bigger than the, what we just showed in Exhibit A. If you compare Exhibit A with Exhibit B, this is more readable. But can you imagine? I wonder if John would be honest enough to say, yeah, I really didn't understand any well, of this stuff. Th this brings me to another whole point. You know, I was ang very angry at the original decisions on shrink wrap licenses. Yes. And now the internet. I just did some very innocent things, some simple application I downloaded on my Android smartphone. Yes. And I had to check, have you read the terms and conditions? They're like 40 pages long when I print them out on my computer. They keep getting longer. What I and say to keep, people, it's become like a triple net lease. Those things started as five page lease right. documents are up to 500 pages now I think in the commercial courts, leases. The courts ought to just give it the finger and say, we have laws to govern these relationships, not contracts. Well, you know what's going on? There's essentially, and we don't want to digress too much, but there's essentially a view that all of these companies can unilaterally create private law in areas that affect the public and in ways that the public are going to continue to push back on because the, some of the stuff that's in these private, what are private agreements, including draconian arbitration clauses, right. draconian waivers of jury rights in every right. which way. And the court so far has upheld, I mean, the Supreme Court has upheld this, but they're going to hit a limit because some of this stuff is like a, a lawyer just going hog wild on this is what we're going to do regardless of whether people like it. If they decide right. they don't like it, they can stop using the right. product, right? Right. Do you remember? No, I, I really feel I... I'd like to see some political movement to limit uh, those licenses, those agreements. Do you, do you remember years ago when Borland and Scotts Valley here in Silicon Valley said, we have a simple license. Our approach is just like you're getting a book. You own the copy and you can use it any which way you want. Just don't treat it like you could photocopy the whole book. You know, you can't do that to a book. Don't do that to our software. I remember that, you know, they, founder was a French guy. He's actually still inventing. He's a smart guy. I'm trying to remember his name. Philippe is his first name. It'll come to me. What is what's, what's the company? Borland, B-O-R-L-A-N. They had a oh, database yes, yes. product called yeah. DBase 2, DBase 3, yes, DBase yes, 4. Yes. They had a great product that never went anywhere called Paradox. Yes. They, they had another product that was the beginning of business intelligence that was called either Quattro Pro or there was another product that was called, there was a, it was a great software company. It could have been arguably another Microsoft, but they just couldn't get to the level of traction as against Microsoft and they ultimately sold out, but they did have a very simplistic approach yeah. to their licensing. But look at this. There's so many different things in this. I don't think you'll see anything that talks about fiduciary duty. So you got to wonder if there isn't an argument somewhere in the story that says, well, wait a minute, this is all contractual. There's no mention of torts. There's no mention of federal fiduciary duty law. What the heck is that anyway? If there is no federal fiduciary duty law, what state? Because DC, the District of Columbia is not a state. Right. I don't think there is a District of Columbia common law. When to the best of my knowledge, there isn't. Maybe someone's going to correct me and say there isn't. Now, here's where you get to Roman three, which I think is really the heart of this. Uh -huh. Non-public information and speaking engagements, right? You may right. not use or disclose non-public information in any post-employment teaching, speaking, or writing. That's a very broad statement because non-public could be public dom information that is not confidential, but isn't widely disseminated. Like what if a hundred people know the otherwise non-public information, some of which include reporters who are sort of off the record? 
is that still confidential information? Because a lot of reporters get leaks all the time, all the time. And arguably that information once leaked is no longer really, really secret and no longer really even confidential. There's a fine line there. At what point do you get there? It goes on to say this limitation does not restrict your ability to teach, speak, or write on a subject within your area of expertise based on publicly available information. This is how we started your educational background, or your personal experiences, mm -hmm. even if that teaching, speaking, or writing deals generally with the subject related to your former area of responsibility. What's your reaction? My reaction is how are they going to convince a judge that this wasn't inside that exception? Well, that's the interesting part. The analogy that I think of, and I wanted to put it to Professor Nimmer, and hopefully in part two we get him on the show, this feels very much like a filtration process where you have to filter out what is the idea versus what is the expression and then draw a line around, you can't do the expression with these words, but you can generally hint at the idea with these words. And they are kind of rewriting probably various sections of the book. And you know that people are going to speculate about all of that rewriting, because they're gonna say, this is not John Bolton's writing. He doesn't act in this way. You could tell, I mean, you could tell someone's writing style. I mean, there are machines that can be trained to, to note it. So I gotta believe someone's gonna provide footnotes to whatever is John Bolton's work and is gonna say, come on, we all know what the 50 changes were, because the changes, if we keep going through this, you'll see the areas that they were essentially intending to change. You know, you'll see things like email addresses taken out and so on. I'm sure those things can be found. I'm sure the phone numbers can be found. But they took a rigorous view, including on his personal email address, because they're like, hey, there's examples of confidential information right there. We're respecting your confidential information. But that email address is probably publicly findable. In fact, I may put an investigator on for part two of the show to find out. But generally, having read just the prayer and just these exhibits, what, what's your sense of the likelihood of success if, you, if you're guiding the judge as kind of an expert on fiduciary duty law, and the judge says, well, Raphael, what do you think? I mean, I don't know what to do with this. Is there really a fiduciary breach here? Is he really like the lawyer who's kind of taking advantage of something that 66068 in California says has to be maintained as secret. I mean, what, what's your reaction generally? I know you have to read the full document. Hopefully I have to read it. And I, and I have a um, constitutional aversion to this concept because if he's a fiduciary, who is the party towards whom he owes the duties, the government or the people of America? Oh, that's a good question because you're drawing a line between the intent of the constitution, which is to protect the people. Right. The government is just an instrument of what's supposed to be protecting the people. Exactly. And the people and are keeps, saying, give us, all the, give us all this information. Trump right. keeps forgetting this distinction. I want you to be loyal to me. No, I want to be loyal to justice and to the American people. So embedded in that is actually another fiduciary question, which is if a judge is looking at this, he's got to ask himself, who is, what would you call it, the Sestu? The Sestui. Sestui, C-E-S-T-U-I, right? Do I have that Correct. right? Correct. And Correct. The person that is the beneficiary of the duty of, who is right. in, intended to, in the higher scheme of things, intended to benefit. And it's not Donald Trump or his family right. personally. Ex it, suppose, it, suppose Trump tells Bolton $450 million was put into the bank for Ukraine troops, you know, to support Ukraine. Right. I took 50 million and put it in my own bank, but don't tell anybody. Yes. What and, about Bolton, and Bolton says, uh, I don't know, sir. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'll probably forget it. I haven't even written it down. <laughs> uh, but no, no. I don't know. Bolton don't know. says, look, my duty is not to you. It's to the people. Well, I think he actually did say that. I think on his way out, he did say that. So let's wrap up because we're going to run out of time here. But hopefully you'll read this and maybe we can pick this up tomorrow if you have time tomorrow or even later today if there's some time later tonight. Because I do think we've now set the stage for the more detailed look at this because 
There's a lot of information here that you could teach a whole law school course around. A whole oh, course could be taught around this lawsuit. I'm not an expert in these statutes, but let me look at it. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.